uh, I think I'm supposed to start. And I, I pictured myself standing, but and you will, no one will accuse me of over-preparing with notes these, this size, but um, I thought I would begin things by um, talking a little bit about this novel, Aurora 7, named for Scott's spacecraft, and um, which came out in 1991, uh, almost 30 years after his flight. And um, an interviewer uh, who had come to talk to me about my books one time uh, asked me what the greatest formative influences on my imagination had been, which sounded like a pretty grandiose question. Uh, but I uh, found myself answering him instantly, that the, the two things that had made me, uh, had set my mind on whatever it was later going to do as a novelist, uh, were the Baltimore Catechism, having grown up uh, as a Catholic uh, on Long Island in the heydays of the New York Archdiocese. Uh, Baltimore, the Baltimore Catechism and Project Mercury was the second one. I was... Uh, Scott and his other six uh, colleagues were selected as astronauts the year I turned eight. I was ten and a half when he went into space. And that whole period of the Mercury flights, which coincided with the Kennedy administration, uh, was the matter of my obsessive attention as a, a young person. Coming in tonight, we passed this cluster of, uh, I saw some boys with crew cuts. Uh, there, and I saw one of them with glasses, and I thought, that was me, 1962. <laughs> and um, this, uh, I mean, if you asked me at the time, uh, you know, I could ra reliably rattle off to you the names of the Yankee batting order, the 12 apostles, and the seven Mercury astronauts. <laughs> Those were the, the three lists I had a complete command of. I, I wrote in some essay many years later about having had the kind of happy childhood that is so damaging to a writer. And, uh, but uh, by the time the late 1980s had come around, I wanted, as a novelist, to write about my childhood. I wanted to sort of uh, capture my parents and something of the world I had grown up in. And I knew from the beginning that space would have to be a part of it, because I had, as I say, been so enthralled by following the Mercury missions. And uh, what I didn't realize at the beginning, what, but what quickly became clear to me, was that the whole thing was going to be suffused with space, and it wound up being set all on a single day. And that was May 24th, 1962. And uh, as I say, Scott's spacecraft and mission gave his name to the book. And I think I picked this. Uh, and I remember consciously uh, thinking, well, which of these flights is it going to be? Once I had it in mind that I'd probably need to do the book on the day of one of the Mercury missions. And I said, it's got to be the Carpenter flight. Because of all of the Mercury flights, uh, I think it's fair to say that Scott's was the most thrilling. It was the most perilous. It was an ambitious flight. And uh, if you are old enough to remember, there was an hour uh, when um, nobody seemed to be quite sure where he was, or <laughs> if he was. And as the Life magazine headline uh, the next week said, 55 minutes that lasted forever. And I thought, this is what a novelist wants for background. This surpassed even John Glenn's troubled heat shield. And so this was uh, my choice. and. Um, I think that uh, the, the reasons for it, I mean, as I researched, um, really held up the, the suspensefulness of it. I remember going through the files that Lyndon Johnson kept on the space program in the National Archives. He was in charge of the space program. And coming across this chilling draft of a typewritten statement offering condolences to your wife and children uh, for the heroic sacrifice you had made when we were unable to find you. <laughs> Underneath that was the statement that LBJ actually gave, which was, welcome home, Commander Carpenter. So glad uh, for your triumph. But they had it ready. And to give you some idea of just what that day was like, two and a half minutes of video. This is from CBS's 
summary of evening coverage. Of course, in those days, space flights were covered uh, round the clock on television. But this was the wrap-up that was offered by CBS newsman Douglas Edwards on the evening of May 24, 1962. It starts with the people watching the monitors in Grand Central. You'll think you're looking at a kinescope of madmen if you watch that series. You'll see lots of hats. Could we have that? For three quarters of an hour this afternoon, the nation's heart stood still. From Cape Canaveral out over the South Atlantic, a message was being radioed over and over again, Aurora 7, Aurora 7, come in, but the message went unanswered, and so did the nation's anxious question about the fate of an astronaut last heard from as he prepared for the risky return to Earth after three worrisome orbits. Then the answer came in a jubilant report from a search plane. The capsule had been sighted in the ocean alongside it, in the jaunty words that came from Cape Canaveral, a yellow life raft, and sitting in it was a gentleman named Carpenter. A CBS News Extra, The Flight of Aurora 7, brought to you by Polaroid Corporation, makers <laughs> of the Polaroid Land Camera, and by Remington, makers of the new cordless electronic two-shaver, and by Philip Morris Incorporated, <laughs> makers of Marlboro, <laughs> Parliament, and Alpine Filter Cigarettes. Well, it started out like uh, Buck Rogers and wound up like a condensed version of Robinson Crusoe. Instead of a recovery, it seemed like a rescue. Tonight, after that national agony of suspense, until he was finally sighted and picked up, the first word from Scott Carpenter is, I feel fine. He's spending the <laughs> night on Grand Turk Island down in the Caribbean, regular check-in point for astronauts on completing their missions, and the only explanation so far of the landing that went awry is just a speculative one. The reason he overshot the scheduled recovery area by some 250 miles may have been a mechanical fault that delayed the firing of his capsule's retro rockets by just a matter of seconds. After the earlier successes of Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn, Scott Carpenter's mission seemed in advance almost routine. Actually, it was our most ambitious challenge yet to the alien environment called space. It required the pilot to do things we hadn't dared ask of his predecessors, a larger degree of control in maneuvering a space capsule, more tests to help measure the way things move in space, and how they look to a man observing them. It was a mission that ran into a whole series of threats and worries all the way, although it could hardly have started out under more favorable auspices. Okay. Before dawn this morning at the launch pad, everything was going uh, more smoothly than on any previous flight. The months of preparation preceding it into its final hours without a hitch. The only cause of minor it was a minor one, a minor concern, a slight ground haze hanging over the Cape, partly caused by forest fires. It could hamper the filming of the launch on which space technicians depend for data on how well the vehicle performs its functions. Okay. At 5.38 a.m., <laughs> Scott Carpenter I, I began like the elevator doing ride doing up the gantry to his waiting yeah. capsule. Um, He'd been up since 2.15 this morning. The novel was um, that... Uh, you know, so intimately linked was what was going on up in space with what was going on in the imagination of this ten and a half year old boy in the book that I decided to link them totally. And the transcript, he wound up writing a large portion of the book. <laughs> Got none of the uh, royalty sport, but only because um, uh, each scene begins with a small swatch of the transcript of communications between the Aurora 7 capsule and uh, the ground controllers. And there's, in every scene, some kind of connection between what goes on in the life of this family on the ground and what's going on uh, up in space. And um, I, uh, as I say, I can't imagine ha rendering uh, that time, that very optimistic time in America, a uh, very happy time uh, in a lot of ways, um, than uh, by uh, doing something that involved Project Mercury. And so it's... Um, we're going to do most of this, I think, as a conversation tonight, but it's a thrill um, to be here with uh, one of my boyhood heroes, as well as my good friend Chris. Uh, the Aurora 7 capsule rests in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, 
Um, but he's right here. Uh, <laughs> it's Pilot tonight, uh, as well as uh, my good friend Chris, who's going to talk about um, the real story, the real nonfiction story uh, of the flight and of Scott's life that they wrote together in For Spacious Skies. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. And it's wonderful to be here tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, your library is beautiful. Um, seeing the film footage from Grand Central Terminal, the day of my dad's flight, is so moving to me. I, uh, I was struck by how worried everyone appeared, and I suppose they were. Uh, the CBS uh, news anchor seemed to be very worried. Um, I was in Florida with my family in what we called the Life House, named after Life magazine. And it was a getaway um, place where we could be hidden away because all sorts of people were looking for us. And, uh, and uh, I, remember, I remember people were worried at the time. And I was watching on television at the time when I wasn't running out to the beach um, and coming back to report. Um, and I learned about my father's safe recovery at the same time the rest of the nation did. Um, and I, but I don't remember the same sense of, of worry at the time. And I think as a result of your safe recovery in 1962, I too had a very happy childhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, and that um, uh, happy childhood and that momentous childhood, and not because of any accomplishment of my own, uh, really, it was my sense of having witnessed a great historic event. And like a lot of witnesses to history, I'm not an actor in history the way my father is. Um, but as a witness to history and with um, a lot of editing help, as I recall, from Tom Mallon <laughs> and, and, um, and some modest writing skills, I was able to help my father make a wonderful contribution to the literature on Project Mercury. And, uh, and he was very, very patient. And uh, in the process, in five years' time, I think I could probably describe yaw, pitch, and roll to all of you. Um, will you help me, Dad? That's right. <laughs> OK. Um, and here I just have a few notes. Um, I was always proud of my dad's accomplishments, of course, and always sort of hyper aware that other people were also interested in him because Life magazine photographers and correspondents were always uh, camping out in the living room. And, uh, and my father was on the cover and my mom was on the cover and it was all very exciting. Um, but it was also normal to me. Um, uh, I always knew, and we started writing the book in 1998, I think, um, about 10 years ago. I started researching anyway. Um, and I always knew my father had uh, a great story that need to be told, needed to be told. But I also knew that like many men of his generation, he was reluctant to tell it. So part of the challenge of writing was getting him to talk. And uh, I think he, you're glad you did. Um, what I learned in writing the book was that his story, the story that we, we took two chapters to write about the space flight itself, something about, uh, and also about the selection process in 1959. But it was really a story that turned into a 20th century family memoir. Um, the story of his accomplishments in space uh, came out of a foundation of accomplishments uh, built by his grandfather, his grandmother, his mother, um, and the sacrifices they made in the first half of the 20th century to make sure he could make history in 1962. Um, and I think that's really all I have to say. I think uh, everyone wants to hear uh, Scott Carpenter speak and not me. And uh, I think we could start off with 
maybe a few questions, Tom. Um, gosh. Um, <laughs> We're just, and there are some yeah. lovely Life magazine uh, photographs that might be cycling through as we're. Yeah, um, they can just run them in the background. Yeah, as absolutely. We talk. We're going to give him the. Uh, I think we'll both be good cop. Uh, okay. Good cop, bad cop, but we're just going to ask him questions. I thought maybe one way to start is um, to ask the pilot himself what happened, uh, that landing uh, that uh, made this uh, so suspenseful. Uh, and thrilling, at least from the public point of view. Well, OK, thank you for that <laughs> question. I would be happy to tell the story. All I needed was a question. <laughs> uh, that question is uh, frequent in my experience. Three issues were all additive. The thrust uh, of the retro rockets was uh, not as high as it should have been. Uh, they um, were pointed in the wrong direction because of a failure of a, a, a horizon sensor, and they were late. All of those uh, errors were additive, and at uh, five miles per second, uh, little errors <laughs> add up to 250 <laughs> miles of a uh, mistake on landing. I held the record for missing the, uh, <laughs> the intent <laughs> landing spot for about uh, seven years, I think. It's a record of questionable value, <laughs> but it, it was uh, broken by s three cosmonauts uh, some time ago who missed theirs by 2,500 miles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was uh, not reluctant to give up the record. <laughs> well, um, this, is a, this is a wonderful picture here taken by uh, the NASA photographer Bill Taub. This is the pre, uh, well, this is the morning of the flight. And you're looking inside, you're checking everything out. Um, so this is about seven in the seven in the morning, I think, May twenty fourth. What most people remark about when they see pictures like that is how small uh, the capsule is. It is small, but uh, it's big enough to do everything inside that you need to do, and it also is weightless when you're required to do those things. And weightlessness makes small uh, spaces subjectively much larger than they, they are uh, in actuality. So it was small, but big enough. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question um, about the 1959 selection process. Um, because of Tom Wolfe's treatment and later the movie, uh, it's now legendary. Um, and it looks sort of like antics in the movie and, of course, the way Tom Wolfe tells the story. But um, what did you think at the time when you were getting orders from the CNO to report to the Pentagon? And when did you first hear the word astronaut? Uh, what I thought at the time of my, my flight to Washington after having received secret orders from uh, signed by CNO. There are a few people in the audience who know the meaning of CNO. It is Chief of Naval Operations and to a junior naval officer, which I was at that time. CNO is about two steps above God. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get orders signed by right. CNO, you obey. And uh, I was on an airplane as directed, picked up a Time magazine and got on the airplane and noticed an article in there saying uh, test, military test pilots were being ordered 
to Washington to fly some kind of new and secret airplane <laughs> or flying machine something. Yeah, the, it, it sort of fit my present uh, situation and I, I thought maybe that's uh, got something to do with me. That's the first time I thought of what was in the offing. The first time I heard astronaut was, uh, was in the briefings. We were told uh, what the project was about, what the capsule looked like, what the tasks might be, what the chances of success might be, and asked if we would uh, uh, care to volunteer. And I think it was in that discussion that the term astronaut uh, was first spoken in my present. The, um, the term cosmonaut uh, followed shortly thereafter, but anyway, I was overwhelmed by the opportunity that this, this uh, project offered, and I volunteered, and I have never understood what, make, what made some of the fellows uh, turn down the offer. It was a marvelous uh, event in my life, and I'm very happy I volunteered. I was recently, the, the 1959 selection process is, um, is a pet interest of mine. We did a lot of research, uh, studied some other finalists who weren't selected um, uh, for group two or even group three. And um, really very interesting, it's, it's confidential today who the, how the, um, the top 18 candidates were ranked numerically because they did, they were given a numeric rank, one through 18, um, but they chose rather randomly from the top 18. They chose the top three and then number five and then I think 11, um, eight, 11 and 15, is that seven? <laughs> and, um, um, and no one knows who was ranked how. And uh, I hope to be doing some more research and, and writing about that uh, once I file a Freedom of Information <laughs> Act request. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, life being what it is, uh, you and John Glenn are the survivors of that uh, small brotherhood of seven men. And, um, who's, as I said, names I could always uh, recite. And uh, I'm wondering if you could just tell us um, in a, it almost sounds like a pun, a, a little capsule version of um, <laughs> something about uh, each of them, these, these names that were once so familiar uh, to Americans. Uh, Americans uh, you know, knew them all uh, by name and by face. And um, just uh, your uh, memories and dominant impressions of them. I mean, maybe we'd start, maybe we'd take them in the order they flew, uh, starting with Alan Shepard. I can't do it in that order. <laughs> <laughs> do it order. in any order you want. Alphabetically, <laughs> it's got to be Carpenter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then following uh, <laughs> Carpenter, Cooper, Glenn, Grissom, Shira, Shepard, and Slayton. And I won't comment on uh, Carpenter's uh, qualities. Cooper's were uh, all stellar, save the fact that he flew for the Air Force. <laughs> uh, but, and that was a constant battle that went on between. You know, I should uh, mention to you that there is some politically proper about the choice of the seven because there were three naval aviators, three Air Force aviators, and one Marine. <laughs> and uh, there was, of course, always a friendly competition be the, between the Air Force and the Navy people. And I won't say anything laudatory about the Air Force fellow, <laughs> but John Glenn, the Marine, 
was my favorite of the bunch. He's a glowing Boy Scout and has always been. Uh, he and I bonded in the early days and share that bond today. Al Shepard, think he was, I think he was probably the brightest. Um, Wally Shira was, di didn't care about being branded the Joker, but he was a Joker and his, his sense of humor helped us survive some tough times. Deke Slayton was poor boy, Air Force, but he was a, a fine, experienced fighter pilot who was all business. Uh, Gus Grissom, also poor boy, Air Force, was a very accomplished aviator, and, and uh, he wasn't talkative, but when he said something, it was uh, worth remembering. Uh, John, and then there's Wally, and who did I leave out? I think you got everyone. Anyway, it I was it was a marvelous group. I remember, and we were bonded. I felt at the time like uh, Dumas's musketeers, and I remember thinking we have have been all for one and one for all just like the musketeers were. And I saw that happen you know, when Al was chosen for the first flight. The other six fellows all thought the choice was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as soon as it happened, we, we abandoned that thought and we were all firmly in support of, of Al Shepard the bond uh, was an empowerment to all of us. And it, uh, let me diverge here a little bit. It's important, I think, to talk about those times in, in terms of some important issues uh, coincidental. The Cold War, the uh, competition we had with the Soviets was a driver for us and it was a driver for them. Uh, that competition now has changed into cooperation and that's fine. We cooperate now very nicely with, with the, uh, not Soviets anymore, the Russians. But we don't have the competition and I've got to remember to say uh, this about the loss of the country of the uh, competition. We don't, we're not supported by the patriotism behind uh, our, our competition with the Russians um, like we once were and it was powerful and we miss it. But I got to say to all Americans uh, don't worry about the loss of that driver because China lurks. Mm -hmm. And that's good for what, uh, for what we do in space. The competition uh, drove the Soviets and we, we learned an awful lot about the many unknowns, but we will still require competition to continue bringing these, these new truths back and uh, China will help us do that. I've gotten, oh, let me say one other thing about writing the book. I was reluctant as my daughter uh, <laughs> mentioned. I think, I think you should explain what this is. Oh, this is, uh, this is desert survival training, I think in 1960. This is Cooper, Carpenter, Glenn, Shepard, Grissom, Shara, and Slayton on the far right. It's outside Stead Air Force Base in Nevada, and, uh, and it looks like Al has spilled something on himself. <laughs> Um, but they were dropped in the desert and given some parachute silk and um,
taught how to uh, cook up scorpion, I think. No, lizards. We learned, lizards. <laughs> we learned that you can eat lizards very nicely. The requirement is hunger. <laughs> uh, one other thing I'd like to tell you about the inspiration this young lady provided. I was reluctant to tell the story. She uh, urged me to do so, but I was unresponsive because I didn't really want to tell the story of the space flight as much as I wanted to tell the story about my, my sainted maternal grandfather, who was my father figure. I grew up, you know, it's a funny thing, because of him, I felt I had a singularly special and privileged upbringing as a child. Many people have written the book that came out of that, that growing up felt that I uh, had, was underprivileged. I was a, my mother was sick in bed, a tubercular. Uh, my parents were separated and I lived in with my grandparents. But I thought I was the luckiest boy in school for having an old, wise grandfather as a father figure instead of the young kids at all that were the fathers of the other boys. So I, uh, that came out of my introspection when we wrote the book, but I didn't want to write about the uh, space flight so much uh, as I wanted to tell about that marvelous man who was, who was my hero as a boy. Chris made me write the book and I, I got the story about Grandpa out, which satisfied my need. But we got the story out about uh, this important space flight and, uh, and I think although I'm biased, that it's the best literature because of the help of, from both of these uh, that uh, came out of the early space program. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for this. <laughs> there was some, um, I'll just make a, a comment since you skipped over the first fellow in the alphabetical list, uh, Carpenter. Uh, you know, the, this term, the right stuff, which has so entered the language, uh, does derive uh, from these seven individuals. And um, one, uh, there are all kinds of evidence of how that got to be, but uh, one way in which you can discover what it means is by poring over that flight transcript I mentioned that became so much a part of this novel I was writing. And during, I'm not sure you even remember this, during your re-entry, either just prior to it or during it, you're going through the usual list of things, checking on things and whatever uh, was cause for anxiety or whatever. And at one point, I think you're talking about fuel, uh, the possibility of uh, fuel running out. And um, you mention this possibility and you say, um, oh, I hope not. <laughs> and it sounds very plaintive. Um, <laughs> But to any real devotee of the period, uh, it's instantly recognizable as you doing an imitation of Bill Dana as Jose Jimenez, yes. the reluctant astronaut. And that was one of his lines, oh, I hope not, when <laughs> the possibility of the rocket blowing up uh, right. was raised. I was going to ask you, in contrast with these other six um, fellows, uh, space history. Uh, often cast you among the seven as the one who was more interested than the others, and I think this is an appropriate venue to ask this question, was more interested in science uh, and in the real implications, the long-term implications of spaceflight, the scientific possibilities, the human possibilities, whereas the other fellows were pilots uh, interested in 
the competitive pyramid that Tom Wolfe talks about, interested in the engineering of the hardware, uh, the machines. And while you, of course, were interested in all that as well, there was this other dimension to you, the science. Uh, is that true? Yes, sir. Uh, that was true, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment, but I've got to get back for just a moment to Bill Dana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because when I said that, uh, I, I consciously copied his answer to uh, Ed Sullivan's question. <laughs> Uh, oh, is that your crash helmet? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking that having run out of fuel and not being unable to control the oscillations that might have gotten the small end into the slipstream that would have burned up through, burned through some of the sh shing shingles, I said, I mentioned that even though I know nobody was listening, but it was being recorded on the onboard tape. It might uh, burn through the shingles on, on the small end because of the oscillations. And then I added, thanks to Bill Dana, oh, I hope not. Yeah. Uh, this, so. this raises a, an interesting point. Tom Mallon talks about the importance of the transcript to his writing of Aurora 7. And I have to say that was the heart of drafting for Spacious Skies, was after doing all of the research and figuring out what yaw, pitch, and roll is, I could sit down and actually go through the transcript, the ground to air, air to ground transcript with my dad. And I read, we read, we just, hours reading it. And I would stop and say, well, what happened? What happened then? Um, and what a rare privilege to be able to talk to the pilot himself. Um, what did you mean when you said this obscure um, uh, phrase? And he knew exactly uh, what had happened, and he could tell me like no one else, uh, no one else can. I do remember the point in the transcript uh, where you uttered, oh, I hope not, and it was at the point which parts of, uh, flammable parts of the capsule were actually sort of tearing away and combusting and becoming orange, greenish clothes and going past the window. And you, have, you were trained to report what you were seeing, and he reported a huge flaming chunk of beryllium going past the window and then said, um, well, I, I hope that's not part of the capsule. So, <laughs> and to, and since the you know the recordings that allowed for the transcript exist, um, it's uh, if you want a definition, I suppose, of the right stuff. I think it would be the calm level of the voice making these remarks while you're riding at I think seventeen thousand miles an hour in a vehicle that's about the size of a club chair. Right. <laughs> um, but, um, but I mean, that what, you know, all that right stuff aside, um, the science in your mission, one of the things, for instance, that you did was the attempted deployment of a, de of a balloon from the capsule to see what, um, was there any drag on it uh, when you were above the atmosphere. And th these were the things, as I say, that um, seemed to interest you in particular in that group. And um, I just wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, that was uh, an important part of your question, and it is true that I, uh, I approached uh, this flight from a point different uh, from what the other people uh, approached the other flights with. I, I characterized it to myself before the flight as being more interested in what I would find out there in this new environment, uh, I, w I cared more about that than investigating the machine that got me there. And that, that is what uh, test pilots and flight test engineers are accustomed to, to uh, having as the purpose of a test flight. 
how's the air, how is the vehicle working? I was uh, had a passing interest in that, but this I was aware w of the fact uh, that that men had a man had ever been in a position to measure the uh, uh, the atmosphere at this uh, altitude and how things behaved at uh, in continued weightlessness. Uh, there were a lot of wonderful astronomical observations that could be made for the very first time that I could help uh, bring back. I was interested in bringing back, and this came from a letter that my dad wrote me, I was interested in bringing back new truths about where I'd been, and the ground was, uh, and it's not improperly so, more interested in my bringing back new truths about the machine that got me there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what you heard is true. I was more interested in doing science in the flight than, than the other guys mm -hmm. had been. And uh, that characterizes the flight, and I stand mm -hmm. on what it, what it brought mm -hmm. back. One thing I'd, I'd like to add in connection with the five experiments that were devised for Aurora 7, uh, they were put together by the KleinConnect Commission. And the months leading up to MA7, a lot of the science was observational, uh, going towards engineering uh, problems that were going to be encountered during Project Gemini. Could you see, what colors could you see in space? Was orange more visible or green? We didn't know until um, you, I think the, in fact, the, def the inflatable balloon was painted in different colors mm -hmm. and you had to actually observe and report yeah. which colors were more visible. Um, also the operation of um, liquids in space. Mm -hmm. You had a little meniscus tube and you had to observe and report on that. So and it wasn't, it wasn't um, dilettante-ish science, it was, forward-looking to the moon landing and, and really important. The, yeah, this is uh, my brother Scott with his nice narrow madman mad men tie on and, uh, and me. And I've fallen asleep, as you can see. It was, uh, it was 100 degrees. It was about 120 degrees inside the press tent uh, that day. And uh, I succumbed to the heat, I'm sure, not uh, to boredom. <laughs> Um, let me, I'm watching the clock. Let me take you into the future for uh, a little bit. Uh, let's imagine a situation where a few years from now, Americans are beginning to see um, Chinese astronauts on the moon, Indian astronauts on the moon, Japanese astronauts on the moon. All three nations have indicated an interest in going there. And um, let's say that competition does sort of galvanize the country in a way that it hasn't been around space uh, for quite some time. What would you like to see the United States doing in space? That's uh, an interesting uh, thing I'd like to deal with. Uh, I would hope that we would learn how to handle that situation uh, from what has gone on in the past. Uh, in to allow us to use that sense of competition in cooperation, and this because the competition will drive us to to uh, do better work and to, if I forgive the pun, higher purpose. But uh, but I think that because of what has gone on in the past, and I've had this, I had this thought at, at the time in the 60s, S space flight is not an operation that should be uh, saved just for Americans like we wanted to in, the, in those years or for the Soviets. It's, um, it's an adventure for all of mankind and all of mankind on this planet should cooperate in, 
in furthering uh, the exploration of this of this frontier. And I would hope that when India and Japan and China and the United States and whoever else uh, might come along has the chance to fly in space, I, I would uh, hope that we could cooperate mm -hmm. and do it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question, and it's sort of current affairs now. It's being reported, and this is a, a, a subject probably dear to all of our hearts as lovers of books and libraries. Um, but it's been reported that the Texas uh, Board of Education is revising its textbooks for fourth and fifth graders, and they're going to take Neil Armstrong out of uh, the scientist category because he's not a scientist. And, uh, and revise the textbooks and then uh, put him in maybe explore a category. Um, his biographer, James Hansen, has written to the Board of Education and he's saying, well, he's not just a pilot. He's a flight research um, pilot and an engineer. And this goes back to your good question, Tom, about science and the importance of engineering science. Um, what do you say to the Texas Board of Education? Define for me a scientist. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. he certainly is that. Yeah. Everybody who, who questions uh, anything involving uh, especially physical science is a scientist. I agree. Yeah, I, the Texas Board of Ed Education has made some other egregious errors. <laughs> I thought, I thought maybe I would put one last question, future-looking question, okay. uh, to Scott, and then do we have time for questions from the audience? I'm hoping we should be getting around to that now. Um, there was an op-ed piece in the New York Times. Uh, within the last few weeks, September 1st, by Lawrence Krauss, who directs the Origins Initiative at Arizona State University. And it was called A One-Way Ticket to Mars. And he put forward a novel, provocative argument. And I'm going to read you the crux of it. He says, the most challenging impediment to human travel to Mars does not seem to involve the complicated launching, propulsion, guidance, or landing technologies but something far more mundane, the radiation emanating from the sun's cosmic rays, the shielding necessary to ensure the astronauts do not get a lethal dose of solar radiation on a round trip to Mars may very well make the spacecraft so heavy that the amount of fuel needed becomes prohibitive. That's the problem. Here's his solution. There is, however, a way to surmount this problem while reducing the cost and technical requirements, but it demands that we ask this vexing question. Why are we so interested in bringing the Mars astronauts home again? <laughs> in other words, if we just let them absorb enough radiation on a one-way trip, they can begin settling the place. And he says, I have found a significant fraction of scientists older than 65 who would be willing to live out their remaining years on the red planet or elsewhere. <laughs> With older scientists, there might be additional health complications to be sure, but the necessary medical personnel and equipment would still probably be cheaper than designing a return mission. And my last question to you is, are you game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the uh, issue that uh, elicits the question from you is not worth listening to. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, that's, there are, every time we do something new, there is an unknown uh, pointed out by somebody that here and there that will make it impossible. It's uh, been fraught with unknown difficulties that make the idea of flying anywhere uh, 
impossible. It's, the radiation is a problem, but it will be licked like we have licked all the other problems. We can do anything we can set our mind on if we work hard enough at it. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, I can't see, but yeah. now I can. Good evening. It's on, yeah, it's on. Now, Scott Carpenter, what I'm about to say here is somewhat in jest. I'm Bob Sandy, a longtime member of the Astronomical League of Kansas City since the year 1960. And over my many years as an amateur astronomer, I've been a firm supporter of the space program ever since. In fact, as part of my honeymoon on May the 24th, 1962, I saw you launched into orbit in a Mercury 7 capsule by an Atlas-centered continental ballistic missile from the beaches of Cape Kennedy. I was right there. And then just a few hours afterwards, a newsman walked up to me saying, quote, did you hear that Carpenter pushed the retro rocket button on his dashboard one second too late and therefore overshot his landing in the ocean by about 300 miles? And do you think he will be all right? And I said, yes, I think he will be fine since I had a lot of faith in the space program. Now, you and I know, and you've already mentioned what really happened that day. And uh, it's been an extreme pleasure to be here tonight to meet you for the first time. And also, I want to introduce someone who uh, recently uh, won an award here in Kansas City. He didn't know I was going to do this, I don't believe. And uh, while I was attending the Kansas City Aviation Expo and Air Show this past Labor Day, I was handed a brochure and schedule of what would be happening there. In it was an article about two young recipients of scholarship awards to the space camp. One of them, Stephen Lorimore, could not be here this evening because of school tests. He's 17 years old. But the other one is here, and I would like to make an introduction. His name is, he's 13 years old, and his name is Cameron Chartier, who won in his age group, the 2009 Mid-America Youth Aviation Association Scholarship Award to Space Camp in Huntsville, Alabama. He won this award by writing two essays, one of them titled, What is my opinion as to whether Pluto should still be a planet or a dwarf planet? <laughs> the other essay was titled, Why should I go to space camp? He also had, a, had to create a patch about aviation incorporating Cameron as part of the patch. Cameron will go to space camp next year in July. He is home taught and excels in math and science and has other pursuits and skills. He recognized, he recognized the opportunity to win the trip to space camp as a great opening to explore a wonderful frontier. Let's give a big hand to Cameron Chartier. Thank you. Thank you. A generic question first. Uh, what were your feelings and thoughts, as they usually say on television, when you saw Mr. Edwards uh, on the screen a few minutes back? And when are we going to Mars? Uh, Mr. Edwards had some uh, great challenges to meet, and I wish him 
luck. We're going to Mars as soon as the uh, company, the country, as soon as the country provides uh, the unified wish to go there. We need purpose. And we need somebody to to replace John F. Kennedy, who will galvanize the nation behind behind the uh, task, and we need somebody to replace Werner von Braun, who will show us how to do it. And when we get the resolve of the nation, we we'll, we can do it in 20 years and it's uh, likely to be accomplished uh, not as soon as we can but when we're we're more likely to be able to do it and that's in 30 years that's a shady answer but it, i'll give you 30 years <laughs> it's a pleasure to hear from all of you um, Scott Carpenter, um, you maybe touched on a little bit with the last question that you answered, but uh, if you were in charge of NASA, where would the program go in the future? To Mars. We're properly directed. We're just not proceeding at a satisfactory rate. We, uh, I saw a schedule for a manned landing on Mars in 1998 uh, when I was at NASA in 1960. Had we not lost our resolve, we would have been on Mars now. <laughs> How many <laughs> experiments could you do in that small, small capsule? It's big enough for what you want to do. <laughs> Scott and all, again, let me, on behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us this week. I have a question for you. You said, as a scientist, you were looking for some new truths. Would you tell me what did you find personally to be the most intriguing, interesting new truth that you personally experienced in your voyage? And secondly, what new truth or question should the American people ask themselves for the future of space? Okay, for the, the first part of the question, I have to go back to the unknowns that uh, that we worked with in those days, and one of the most pressing unknowns was the fireflies that John Glenn saw. All of the brightest minds in Houston were wondering, were those fireflies really living creatures that are out there uh, in orbit around the Earth at 200 miles? That's, that was a pressing unknown, and I was given a chance to find out that they were little pieces of ice. That it's a simple unknown, but it was nevertheless a mystery. Um, and it, it was one of the, the new truths that came back from my flight among many others mostly uh, astronomical uh, observations. But um, what is the most important thing to come out of these flights for the people of the, uh, of the home planet? It, it will ultimately provide us with the answer to the question, are we alone? And I think uh, that uh, we're likely to find we are not. I think it's very, uh, well, it's outrageous that we could suspect that we are the only living creature in 
in the cosmos. And that is the, the most impressive new truth that will come. And I think in this century, to come to the family of man is that there are others somewhat like us out there. I'm here on behalf of this no, shy young to say that. <laughs> gentleman named Gus, who often is a few words himself, who is wondering if you have some perspective on Mr. Grissom's splashdown and what really happened that day. Okay, yes. Nobody knows for certain what happened. And it's going to be impossible to prove what happened. The, there is evidence in to be found on the hatch, which has taken a falling leaf pattern through 19,000 feet of water. It will never be found. But on that hatch, there is evidence that it was not, the explosive bolts did not uh, did not actuate because he Gus uh, unintentionally hit the the uh, jettison button. That would prove forever that Gus didn't do it. Nobody knows what happened, but I can tell you I know Gus didn't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I can tell you. We, there, nobody knows what happened for sure except Gus, and he's gone. In discovering the, uh, the secret of the fireflies, I'm, this comes to mind from when you're talking about banging on the that's right. hatch. Uh, how did you solve the mystery of the fireflies and figure out that these were pieces of ice that were coming off the capsule? Good old American know-how? Yeah, well, no, no, really, <laughs> just observation. I was getting ready to stow my equipment on a, on a wall filled with, uh, covered with Velcro. And I wanted, and this is just prior to re-entry, you want to make sure you get all of the loose articles fixed somewhere. And Velcro was very handy for that purpose. I slammed the cam back of the camera into the hatch so it would remain there through the acceleration of entry. And a whole cloud of fireflies flew past the, wind th the window. And I remember if you realizing that these were not critters out there, it was something that, that was attached to the, uh, the capsule itself. I remember saying to the ground, there are clouds of the fireflies here and their capsule emanating. And they did, and it, we, it makes good sense for the water vapor that's exhausted by the cabin and the soup circuit. Uh, uh, cooling systems to immediately freeze and adhere to, uh, to the skin of the spacecraft. This happens on airplanes, but it never occurred to uh, us at the time that that's what it was. So it was just an, an obvious mm -hmm. answer to a silly unknown. And most of the unknowns now, courtesy hindsight, were pretty silly. Commander, it's a professor. <coughs> Sorry. A couple questions. One was, what was your guys' feelings when you found out the Soviets had beaten you? And number two, have you ever met Major Yuri Gargarin? If you did, what was he like? I never met Yuri. I met his, his, uh, his comrade, uh, German Titov. Uh, and the first question I didn't understand yeah, it, how did you feel when you learned that uh, Gagarin had gotten into space before the Al? Yeah, okay. Uh, that I, I didn't want to say the Soviets beat us. <laughs> that, that's painful. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I am loath to say that we beat the Soviets to the moon. 
uh, I, we, we didn't win the race. The Soviets lost the race. And, it, and um, to go directly to your question, everybody was disappointed that they, the Soviets were first. N mainly Al Shepard, because it, it took Al's chance to be this planet's first spaceman away. I felt differently about that than, than most, I think. I, I was pleased by the early Soviet successes because I firmly believed we didn't own the experience in the United States. It's man's adventure, and if they did it, more power to them. That uh, response didn't meet with a lot of favor among some people in, in Houston, but uh, I welcomed their successes. Um, does that take care of the question? <laughs> Uh, did you have any contact with Warner von Braun? Uh, what was he like? Yes, he was. I had a frequent contact with uh, that blinding genius. He's the brightest, smartest, and one of the best-looking men I've ever <laughs> known. He was. He was a, a a genius, and without him. We really couldn't have done it, at least in the time uh, that we ended up doing doing it. He had a great sense of humor, and thank you uh, for that question. It, it it qualifies as one that might have been asked by a good straight man. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about Werner von Braun. When the seven of us met him in Huntsville, Early in uh, 1959, we were, and some other NASA people, invited to a dinner at his home. And we were all standing around in the backyard after dinner, and he was speaking. And he, he was brilliant beyond measure, but he was, he was properly modest. He was aware of the fact that he and his the Russian crew that he brought with him uh, was very important, crucially important to the American uh, space program. Uh, and he was aware of the fact that the rest of his team from Pinamunde was as important to the, the Soviet program as he was. And he foresaw a competitive race to what he called a space platform and a race to the moon. And we all stood around and listened to him prognosticate all of this. And he said, you know, I think, I think the race to the moon will end in a tie when the American astronaut will land in his lunar lander at the same instant that the Soviet cosmonaut will land in his uh, lunar lander. They'll open their hatches, climb out, walk over to each other, and shake hands, and the conversation will be, hello, Dieter, hello, Wolfgang. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Commander, Thank you. for an excellent lecture. I've never heard that one. <laughs>